going to talk about a school that I co-organized called Trade School. It's a barter-based learning model, and it's a collective. So I'm one of six people this year in New York that organizes Trade School. But there are trade schools opening all over the world in different cities. I just thought that I would step back before talking about trade school and hopefully help you understand how I got into that work and then where it's taking me even further. So um, I was thinking that it probably started when I was 20. Eight years ago, I was in New York. I had been in school for two years. Uh, I went to Cooper Union with Christine here. And um, coming from Rhode Island, I grew up on an island. I was very shocked to discover that public space in New York felt like it was mainly used for um, transitioning between the subway and work and shopping. People were rarely gathering on the street in the way that I had hoped New York City would make possible. So I was walking around in New York trying to figure out what to do. I was in art school. I wanted to have an audience that wasn't just the kind of people I saw in museums and galleries. I really wanted to have a range of people react to things that I made. And I knew that I didn't want to make paintings or sculptures. I wanted to make things that would encourage people to behave differently. So it could be something like a designed object or a performance that I did in public space. But I wanted to make something where I could gauge people's reaction immediately. So as I was walking around in the East Village, I noticed that all of the stop sign posts have holes in them that go all the way down to the ground, even though the signage is just at the top. So I started thinking, this is an invitation. There is so much room here to do something else. And in a city that seems to be so busy, what if there were places for people to stop? So it was pretty simple. Um, I was 20, I decided I'm gonna make public seating for New York City. Um, on my own, I just went into the shop at Cooper Union and started cutting wood uh, 16 by 16. I rounded out the corners and routed out the edges so that it looked really well made. It was fine grade plywood and I got deck paint and made it nice and shiny so that it almost looked like plastic. People who don't make things actually thought that I manufactured it and it was some kind of uh, polyurethane or plastic object, but it was just wood. And then I welded a frame and made it secure so that I could walk around the streets of New York, plain clothes, and pretend that I was locking my bike, but pull out a public seat and use a drill with a ratchet set to zip the public seat to the stop sign post. So um, this was incredibly exciting for me. Um, I think it says a lot about my inclinations at 20 and also my sense of privilege as a white person that I could just walk on the street and not be worried about the ramifications of doing something like that on the street in plain clothes. But it transformed me radically because I realized that if I had an idea and I just wanted to test it out in public space and get a lot of feedback through people's engagement, I could do it like that. And throughout the course of the next two years, I put up seats all over where I lived and where I worked, and also in Rhode Island because I'm from there. And I got to see people actually taking a break, um, waiting for a bus, looking at graffiti, I placed them in areas that I thought needed more space for resting. And this made me realize that um, the city allowed these kinds of interventions. The city welcomed people's um, responsibility for action. So it wasn't just graffiti. It was something that was a plausible alternative. It wasn't just a possibility of how space could be, but it was actually a way to reconfigure space that people experienced directly. So they knew it was possible because they were sitting on it. Um, and actually in Rhode Island, they started cleaning the graffiti that had accumulated on them off. They accepted it into their own system as though it had appeared and they didn't know why. So this made things even more exciting for me because I realized that I had used, ooh, I'd used the right codes. I knew how to cross into this other realm of legitimate power, even though I was just one person and I had just done this thing, learning how to weld, learning how to do woodworking, just in school. 
So that made me think about other public spaces where I could interact with people and challenge norms. And I started thinking about the subway. It was a commute that I did every day, and I often felt that I recognized people who lived in the same area as me and then went to work someplace else, but we never spoke to one another. It was also around 2003 where the announcement started coming that said on the subway, if you see something, say something. And to me, this was very violent because it claimed our eyes as a kind of surveillance, where every stranger was a potential terrorist and every bag was maybe a bomb. But I wanted objects to be excuses for interaction, and I wanted to connect with people and see strangers as potential collaborators or lovers. I was new to New York City. So, um, so I started looking at all the ephemera and objects that are typical to the subway to figure out how I could intervene in a way that might be a little incognito. Um, and I noticed backpacks and backpacks. And I kept thinking about backpacks. And I realized that um, the cordura, like the webbing that you have on your backpack, is actually used by climbers. It's really strong. So I was thinking I could take it to its legitimate, uh, the most wild extreme, um, but still use this legitimate backpack material. And I made it into this strap that can go around the handrail. So I engineered a bag with this guy who was studying engineering at Cooper Union named Greg Thompson um, that could snap open. And then there would be webbing so that you sit on it. And the um, straps for the backpack elongate and go around the handrail. So uh, I made a rule for myself, which was that I would only ride this swing on the subway alone. This was because I wanted to encourage people to engage differently with me. And I thought if I went with a friend, it would be a closed off playground where we had asserted our power and our ability to make anything into a playground, but just for us. So I used this rule for about a year, swinging on the subway. And it was really amazing to see how people reacted to me. Um, <laughs> often in New York, they just kept reading their book. They're like, whatever, I've seen everything. Um, <laughs> but other people would come up to me and they'd say, hey, can I use that? And I'd be like, OK. Um, and then we'd start talking about public space. And I'd have these encounters with people that I would never have met otherwise. And I thought I would start with those two examples, the public seat and the swing, because there are very small actions that I took to claim my own agency, which anyone can do. And in terms of disruption, I want to just flag that for me, what was not satisfying about those projects is that they're very short term. They were just um, small moments of shock or rupture that helped people see the limitations of the spaces that they occupy or exist in. Because I, I transgressed norms or boundaries and then made them visible by doing that. But it was very short. And I think as an artist, I want to think through the logical conclusion of the world that a project imagines. So what do I want? Do I want a place where I have to build public seating because the city doesn't allow people to sit down? <laughs> or do I want to take responsibility for a larger vision in which this is one action that heads towards a broader picture? And I thought um, if I want to go through an activist framework, yes, I would have these tactics of some kind of direct action or seating and swings that help build a public imagination about something bigger. But I should also look at broader strategies around consciousness raising and educating each other. So one thing that I realized when I graduated from school is that most people making projects like me, and there's actually a lot of people that make this kind of work in public space, don't have funding to do it. And this is actually a structural issue. Um, Many of them would not want funding, but also there is very little funding for the arts. So since everyone is creative, not everyone claims that agency and makes creative work or shows it, um, how can we acknowledge this abundance of creativity and help people get the support they need to make their work? When uh, we have an economic system that's founded on scarcity, it's hard to imagine abundance and imagine the fact that everyone here has a project that they want to do. They might not have money to make it happen, but they have skills. So now it's, it was about 2007, the financial crisis hits, and I start thinking about the fact that even though money's gone for a lot of people, it doesn't mean that they have lost their skills. 
They still have so many talents. And if only they could connect to each other in the city, they could make more projects like this happen. So I started an experiment. Um, I made a dress. Uh, it's a work dress. It looks something like a suit mixed with a tool belt and a party dress. Um, I was trying to figure out how to perform myself at work and getting really frustrated around norms of um, restraining women's bodies in order to seem professional. Um, I really didn't want to wear heels or skirts, so I thought this dress would um, somehow encapsulate this kind of desire for a woman with many occupations. So I made it, and I said to anyone who wants it, you can't buy it from me. You have to trade with me, just to see what this conversation would be like. So all of a sudden, I would be at a fair, some kind of craft fair, and have the dress out, and someone would be like, oh, I want that. How much is it? And I'd say, well, you have to slow down for a second. Um, what do you do? And then they'd tell me. And eventually, I got all kinds of things, like a photographer for all of my performances. I got my personal website that way. I got unlimited access to laundry, because if you didn't have laundry at the time. Um, and I also got to know a lot of people that I wouldn't have met otherwise. My friend Louise Ma made the website, and this eventually grew into a larger network in New York called Our Goods that Carl Taschen was a computer engineer for. Um, so a bunch of people gathered around this idea thinking that it's not just the work dress. There are so many skills in New York and so many people that actually feel isolated as artists and want to connect to each other. So Jen Abrams, a choreographer, got involved in the project. Louise Ma, a designer and illustrator. Rich Watts, an engineer, and Carl Taschen. And so we launched this thing and started connecting people. And what we realized is that because it's a virtual site, we hadn't taken responsibility for the difficulty of having a conversation about what your work is worth to someone else. It's actually incredibly difficult to try and figure out, without money, what's fair. We thought it would be automatically transformative and people would be able to have these in-depth conversations that also led to concrete action, like getting their work done. But in fact, people were just frightened and absolutely scared to try and figure out what happens when they don't let the market judge what their work is worth. So whether they would do it based on how much time they spent, how much training they had, maybe even just their desire to connect to the other person in their community, these were very nebulous conversations that people had very little experience with. And so at one point when Rich Watts, one of the co-founders of Our Goods, had a client who couldn't pay, he said, what if you give me your storefront in exchange and we'll call it a deal? It's like, I've been bartering a lot, it's okay. You have this storefront, that'll be fair. And they said, yeah, we'll accept it if we like your idea. So Rich and Louise and I met with these guys at Grand Opening in the Lower East Side to get this storefront, if they liked our idea. And first, we were coming up with pretty bad ideas, like bartering for cookies and bartering for presents. And it didn't, they were not into it at all. And finally, someone was like, what if we had a school where students paid teachers with barter items? And I was like, that is the idea. Because I know so many people that are running alternative schools in New York, and so many people who want to share skills and value each other without money. So that started trade school. Um, for 35 days, we had this storefront in the Lower East Side, and people just came out of the woodwork. The first week, it was all people we knew. We got a mushroom expert, this guy Gary Linkoff, a party organizer. We got a range of people who had skills and fields that were very distinct and who had a broad range of communities that were cross-pollinating. And we invited all the students to become teachers. So the next week, there were a lot of people we didn't know. And it sort of grew in this huge way so that on our last day, people assumed that we'd been open for a year and we're going to be open forever. But actually, we only had the storefront for 35 days. So for the first time also as artists and designers, we became responsible to a kind of desire that was out of our own reach. It wasn't just about what we wanted in space, it was about what New Yorkers were telling us that they couldn't not have. So we recalibrated our way of working and thought about learning how to become a group 
and provide this kind of alternative schooling to people. And we managed to raise rent to open again, this time in a Catholic school, uh, which had closed. And that had its own problems. Like they told us that their main stipulation was no live penetration. <laughs> That's literally, that was their fear. So we signed the contract. <laughs> we were like, don't worry, it's going to be fine. <laughs> we think. I mean, anyone can propose a class, so you never know. But, um, and then that year, we had a lot of volunteers come in who were really excited and they wanted to support the classes and host. Because the first year had just been the three of us and it was, we were maxed out and really tired as volunteers. Um, so the next year, we had all these volunteers and we started realizing that they had more direct experiences of the classes than we did. Because we had started to retreat and work on the infrastructure of the website. And they knew what was going on in the classroom. So rather than just having them be volunteers with no ideas, just bodies who are supporting this project, we decided that they should become collaborators and we should be a cooperative. So this means that you have to share power and information to distribute tasks and share skills so that you can build the kind of resilience you need if you're a volunteer group. And so after that, that was a three month session of trade school. We were able to open again, and this time with a developer who said, I want to make software open source for you so that anyone anywhere in the world can coordinate classes that are run on Barter. Because we had been getting requests almost every week from people around the world, but they were not designers or developers. They couldn't possibly coordinate everything themselves. Some of them did, and they did it analog in Guadalajara. They're running smoothly that way. But a lot of people wanted to coordinate over email, and they wanted to use a website for signups. So this guy, Or Zubalski, came into the team and said, I'm going to build this thing. I'm going to spend my entire summer working on it. And now we're able to give this package to anyone who wants it, as long as they agree to our principles. So I think it's really important when you build tools to realize that the tool will not transcend history. That actually we come into all these experiences with privilege and oppression, and we have to learn how to talk to each other about the way we use the tool and the goals of the tool so that we can actually transform ourselves together. And that is very important with trade school. Yes, it's a barter-based model. Maybe not that many people would use it to exploit each other. <laughs> Who knows? But it's very important to us that we don't just project an image of justice and sustainability without living that in our group. So for example, in the group, it has to be a collective. We will not give the software to someone who isn't willing to share power from the outset. It's also just too tiring. Like, you need help. And that's the kind of resilience that allows us to keep growing. And now we're at a point where even within our group, we share skills. So OR is training other people to write code in Python so that they can get jobs that subsidize the volunteer work. And we've built a level of trust by meeting every single week that's incredibly powerful. And so uh, thinking about trade school, we started getting involved in all these issues because people came forward to teach classes on things like prison abolition, the school system in New York. And we realized that trade school is not a solution. It's just one of many models that people are working on to try and build mutual aid and cooperation. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> So it's really important to think about the ways that these DIY models actually go hand in hand with austerity. It might seem counterintuitive, but if we just applaud ourselves in a class bubble while entire social welfare systems and infrastructure fall apart, we're actually assisting that. And we have to be very conscious of the ways that all these grassroots efforts can link together to build energy and build resilience. So it's not our barter network versus the time bank versus the credit union. It's actually all of these initiatives coming together to say we share values and we imagine a different world together. So we need to build across platforms. So now there are a lot of alternative schools and we all teach together in New York. We often, there's an Occupy University, a free university, a lot of freedom schools. And we do events together because we want to share teachers and students. Same with the barter network. We're now working with a time bank, and there's a credit union which will promote time banks and barter networks, which is incredible. So um, globally, this is referred to as the solidarity economy, or the human economy, sometimes the social economy. And what's been really satisfying in New York is seeing a group of people come out of the woodwork who say, 
this model works for me in my communities, and your model works for your community. Sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. But what matters is that we're all struggling together, and there is no blueprint for a better world. We have the things that work in our communities, and as long as we can learn to support one another, we can do something that is incredibly strong. So I wanted to make sure that I get this on the table. So as we talk about tools and ways of disrupting, people really think about the larger picture and ask themselves to take responsibility, not just for the thing they're doing right now, but for the entire process of producing that thing. Maybe it should be cooperative. Maybe there should be more dialogue. But also the ramifications long term to really step back and reflect and think about what you need to know and who you need to be in order to communicate the message you want to communicate. Um, there's this guy, Mark Fisher, who wrote a very depressing essay called Capitalist Realism, but I recommend it. Um, and he talks about four main things that we need to consider as we move forward. One is an ADD pathology, where we have no time to actually do the research or develop the relationships in order to really commit to something and understand the complexity of the problem. Another one is reflexive impotence, which means you know something, but it doesn't change your behavior. This happens a lot in school, where you don't consider the ways that you are creating a system of debt and information hoarding while you imagine a better world. So ADD pathology, reflexive impotence, what are the other things? I think the main things that he's trying to say are just that in order to counter all of these systems, we need to think about slowing down. So to counter the ADD pathology, we need to think about how we can slow down and commit to each other. To counter reflexive impotence, you need to think about how your actions are actually educational. So we called it trade school because it's about practical wisdom, like hands-on experience actually acknowledging that philosophy is embedded in craft. Um, it's important to value the experiential knowledge that is all around you and not just have ideas about how something might be that you've never tried out. So as much as possible, I'd say um, read that essay. And when you think about disruption, think about long-term effects. Um, Christine and I have been organizing a space in New York for four and a half years. And it has 30 people, it's 8,000 square feet. And the reason I was able to do all of these projects is because we committed to each other and built out this space on a scale that would be impossible alone. It enabled her to go to grad school and me to stay, and now her to come back to New York and me to go someplace else. Um, recently, this guy who had been in our space, um, it was the anniversary of his death. Um, he died a year ago. And as much as it's incredibly sad to be there and try and understand what to do when someone from your space is gone, I just keep thinking about the fact that we were able to hold the space for his family. And it would have been impossible alone. Like, I couldn't hold that space for his mom. Colin couldn't do it, Brendan couldn't do it, but together we were able to each sit with her for a lot of hours and cook food and make this kind of space that isn't about isolation where success means being alone and being unvulnerable just being alone and paying for any needs that you have to me success is really about recognizing that we're interdependent and having this moment where when someone dies you can come together as a community to hold space for this person because you know that it's not about the space it's about the relationships and that is what builds success